Hey folks, welcome to Crimson Clover World Explosion. <clears throat> this is a shoot 'em up game, so it's completely different to the sort of games that I normally play. And this is going to be even more different because I've never played this game. <laughs> okay, it's completely new to me. Um, I really do like shmup games, but I'm a casual, I'm a casual shmup player. I'm not very good at them, I'll be honest. Um, but you know, I'm trying to get better at them. I really like Dodon Pachi uh, Diojo, which I have on the Switch. I think it's one, it's one of my favourite games. It's really, really good. Uh, but everybody's been recommending me to play this game. They say it's like one of the best uh, shoot 'em up games on the market, bullet hell style. And yeah, so I thought it'd be kind of amusing to just jump straight into it and just see how see how I do. <laughs> so let's just hit start game. I've I've actually gone in and set the uh, the screen up and stuff. Um, I do actually want to check the controls before I do anything else. I thought it might be kind of useful for anybody who's kind of you know maybe they search for this and just they want to see somebody's first time reactions playing the game from somebody who's not like a, a shmup expert so uh, let's just go into settings and key settings and just check out the controller okay so yeah I'm using an arcade stick to play this uh, so one okay so we've got lock break power up okay so I, I did have a quick look on wikipedia just to try and see what the mechanics are in this game it's a little bit different to dodon the game i'm used to uh, i'm just gonna play a novice for the first playthrough even though i, t I tend to just put them straight on the hardest mode <laughs> okay so this is the standard mode uh we've got right there's loads of different game settings in these often based on different versions of the arcade um let's just go with this base ship to start off with looks like there's a tutorial as well Okay, attack button one, shoots with the main cannon. I really love how powerful these games make you feel. Just look at look at how look at how much firepower is coming out of that damn thing. <laughs> okay, so you lock onto the uh, Okay, release the lock on button, you'll blast all enemies. Okay, so this is how you get your score multiplier, I guess. Warning, your ship will fly slower while trying to lock onto enemies. Alright. Brake button. Effects depends on the brake gauge. Okay, so it's got a bomb gauge as well, or a brake gauge. If the gauge is over the bomb line, a bomb explodes while pushing the brake button. Okay, so that's your standard bomb attack. Bomb explosion will destroy enemies and enemy shots, and your ship will be invincible for a short time. Standard shrimp stuff. The brake gauge fills up when you shoot enemies and again for shooting enemies down. Don't know if you guys can hear me over this, so I'm just going to drop the volume a little bit. Okay, then we got brake mode as well. Yeah. If you trigger another brake mode while in brake mode. <laughs> you enter double brake mode, which your shots are even more powered up. However, while in double brake mode, you cannot use bombs and the brake gauge will be reset to zero once the timer is up. Okay. So it seems a little bit like the super kind of the special mode that you're in, hyper mode, whatever it's called in Dodonpachi. Diojo. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to launch. Okay, I'm going to have to figure the buttons out as we go. <laughs> okay, I probably should be using the... Uh, the special as well. There we go. There we are. Look. That's better. <laughs> it's so chaotic. I abs I love it. I you know what? When I first saw these kind of games, these sort of shoot 'em ups, I wasn't a fan. I really preferred more classic shoot 'em ups like R Type or Gradius or Gladius. But um, I'm I'm sold on the bullet hell now. I've got to tell you. Uh, now I've started getting my head around them, how they play, and you know that they're not actually as overwhelming as they look. This is this is really really fun gameplay, man. So I've been playing a lot of arcade games recently, and um, now for those of you who are fans of my channel, you'll know that I'm mostly a strategy game channel. Um, I'm very very focused on super complex, um, very very lengthy to play strategy games, and what and I also work in the I currently work in the games industry as a contractor for for a games developer. So I play a lot of strategy games when I'm at work and in my spare time on the channel. And honestly, after a while, 
you kind of crave a bit of a break. I probably should be using this other thing as well. Ah, okay, the first death. And uh, yeah, so I've, been, I've kind of I've kind of burned out on strategy games a little bit. Now, I've started playing Galactic uh, Galaxy 4 again because I really really like that game. Uh, there we go. Well, let's get some of these. And uh, but yeah, I, I want to put some more arcade like content out on my channel because not only does it broaden what my channel covers. I've noticed that there's a lot of problems with modern game design in strategy games that have kind of been discussed similar topics that are very very relevant in stra for strategy games that have been kind of solved in other genres or at least have been talked about in a way that I just don't see people talking about in strategy games and um, so just from the oh here we go look so just from the, the topic of trying to get my head around what makes good games good what makes good games design and why it is that I'm really turned off by a lot of modern strategy game games design um, I've been kind of turning to these sort of things because games design is really pure man. like in these kind of things right in this sort of game when you know your maximum play length is what about an hour maximum maybe about half an hour or 40 minutes for a playthrough of one of these things you've got to get the game right okay it's got to be right and you've got to get people excited right from the start now you'll notice in games like this, this is the novice mode by the way, so it's going to be really easy um, compared to the sort of like more difficult modes. But you'll notice the gameplay starts right from the start of the game. There's none of this kind of onboarding, you know, this kind of uh, beginner focused, oh we need to make the first, we need to make the first hour or two hours of the game really easy, really gentle, so that people don't refund during that, cru that crucial two hour steam refund window. And um, that is starting to become a real big problem in a lot of games. It's not just a problem in things like, you know, modern AAA games where it's a real issue. You know, just think about your classic Ubisoft game where the first four hours of gameplay is just absolute garbage, boring, mostly filled with cutscenes. You're waiting around for most of it. Uh, you know, it's just extended tutorials telling you how to do stuff that you've already done thousands of times. No respect for legacy skill, that kind of thing. And I'm find I'm starting to see all the same problems now in modern 4X. Oopsie. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue. So, okay, this is the difficulty is ramped up a little bit more on this. Okay, so oh, there we go. So we got to cancel, and it killed everything on the screen. Very nice. See what I mean? Look how powerful this makes you feel. It's really really good fun. I was just talking about this on Explominate, and I was uh, using Shmups as an analogy for. Why certain strategy games, especially in Fantasy 4X games, right, where you've got magic systems, some of the modern games uh, that are really popular, like Age of Wonders, I don't like so much because they, they just feel like uh, the, the sort of the analogy I was using was that, like, in some of these modern f Fantasy 4X games, right, you're kind of feeling like you're you're fighting with a Nerf gun rather than a real like an AK-47 <laughs> or an M16, right, uh, and everything's so overbalanced and they're just Modern games designers are so terrified of people finding something that, you know, quote unquote breaks their game that they don't really allow players that sort of to be able to experiment with really kind of crazy, you know, yeah, sort of half broken mechanics. Like, let's think about a game like Master of Magic, right? In Master of Magic, Master of Magic is really well balanced, or at least Caster of Magic is. But um, this is a similar kind of thing, right? In Master of Magic, You've got like a flying enemy, yeah? And if you haven't got something that can counter that flying enemy, you're just gonna lose, okay? You're just gonna lose because you've not thought about the fact that your enemy can throw flying enemies at you. And if you've not got a web spell or something that can bring that flying enemy down to the ground so you can hit it, or you've not got archers, you lose. And that's as it should be, right? That's, I really think that that's as it should be. By the way, I don't think I'm really making the use of Crimson Clothes as mechanics here. Now, um, what Age of Wonders did was it was just like, okay, um, players are complaining now because they're coming up against a battle that they can't win because they didn't think. <laughs> yeah, they didn't. They didn't like go. Oh, um, I my enemy can potentially come at me with with flying enemies, so I need to prepare for them. Uh, instead, they got lazy and just kind of built this sort of generic sort of army, and they didn't think about what their what potential their enemy could come out with. So instead of instead of saying to players, okay, what you need to do is. If you're coming up against an enemy, you know, an army that can potentially have flying units in them, or you know, a character class or a build that can potentially have flying units, you need to be able to counter that. And you need to think about that and build it into your army. 
instead they just made it so they don't have flying units anymore. <laughs> they just took it out. So, so you know, in, in order to kind of placate a very, very small number of people who don't really play the genre very much and they want everything to be easy and kind of, you know, kind of crappy and easy because, you know, they're not willing to lose a few times before they start to win. They just strip game mechanics out. And that really bugs me, okay? It really, really bugs me. It's one of the reasons why I kind of really going off modern strategy games. And I've found that games like... Um, there, there are some games that I play that don't f suffer from that issue. For example, the Illwinter games. Like, you know... And I always use the example of, in Conquest of Elysium, the death spell, right? The death spell... You come up against somebody who's got the death spell and you've got no counter for it. You're going to lose, <laughs> right? You are going to lose. And you, you... So... Conquest of Elysium is made so that it's quite easy to avoid battles, right? If you're scouting properly and, you know, you're playing... God, this is hard. <laughs> um, and you're playing in a way that is not careless, even if you come up against an enemy that has this really, really crazy powerful spell like Death Spell that can just delete your entire, you know, your entire army within a few rounds, you can, just, you can still... Jesus! <laughs> you can still win, right? Because you don't have... You're not forced to engage it. But again, in modern in modern fantasy forex games, instead of having something that's that powerful and forcing the player to think about the you know their strategic move maneuverability, how am I going to avoid this big army until I've come up with you know I've recruited some units that are immune to the the spell that they're throwing at me? Instead, they just take it out. They just go, oh, okay, well that's too obviously unbalanced. It's not unbalanced. You just don't know how to make the game. You don't know how to design the rest of your game around very fun player focused mechanics like that and so um, as I've as I started to kind of realize this problem with modern strategy games I've kind of started to I, I've started to look at other genres to try to figure out how it is that these games remain fun for both beginners you know like so they're approachable for beginners but they don't neglect Players like me who've been playing video games for 30 years, right? And have got a leg 30 years of legacy skill to kind of build on. Okay, I'm having to concentrate here now. <laughs> Let's just use this bomb. There we go. Okay, I probably misused my break mode there, but there we are. So, yeah, this is the question, right? In modern strategy games, how do you, how do you onboard new players so that they are, you know, enjoying the game right from the start without refunding within two hours because you know the game's too like too brutal for them but you also don't make your games t like boring for p people with legacy skill which is basically 95 percent of the audience okay so like a lot of a lot of modern strategy games now i just can't be bothered to play them because i know that the first few hours of gameplay on every campaign is going to be kind of boring it's less of a problem in 4x as it is in other strategy t games i think um because 4x has always got something that you can be doing but whether the whether those decisions are meaningful or not is kind of another thing. So yeah, that's that's where my head has been at recently. I'm kind of trying to I'm trying to look at the problem of kind of crappy modern games design and strategy games from a more positive perspective. And rather than just kind of bitching about it all the time, I want to be trying to figure out okay, what can we do to fix this problem? You know, is this is this a problem that is being inflicted on modern audiences because of a, the Steam refund system, um, you know, the Steam review system. I think that's certainly part of it. Is it because games developers feel the need, uh, to, you know, because the, the games are expensive to develop now, right? And they need to be, they need to be bringing in new players. And more importantly, they need to be bringing in casual players as well. Um, casual players who don't always stick around long enough to really justify the, the financial investment in you know making mechanics to placate them because uh, this is going to be a bit of a controversial statement and I, I have to be very careful to, to state this in a way that is accurate okay uh, be, especially since I work in the games design industry but I think ooh, that hurt I think when you're making games right you have to con when you're when you're a games developer and you work in the industry you do have you absolutely have to consider whether your game sells all right and what makes games sell is not at all congruent with good games design all right in fact I'd, I'd argue that most of the stuff that is that game developers are having to put into games design now in order to make games sell and be you know and be saleable is 
absolutely directly antithetical to what makes good and e strong, elegant games design. Uh, we see this not only with, you know, really low, obvious low-hanging fruit, like microtransactions. Um, you know, that's, that's you know, DLC, the, the, the need to make DLC, the need to make your games like a games as a service or constantly monetizable. Um, that's a big issue, obviously. But that's the low-hanging fruit. I'm talking about other stuff, like like making games boring and, and easy and really, really just kind of chill and crap for the first two hours of play. At least. In order to, you know, kind of bring in these newbie gamers and, and to prevent them from... Ooh, and prevent them from refunding that early. So, yeah. How, uh, so anyway, uh, with that said, um, I kind of when I'm talking on a commercial level, like when I'm at work, and you know when I'm talking when I'm talking to people about how do we make games more fun um, for people, newer people, so that we can sell lots of games. I don't have this opinion I'm about to state. Okay, it's a very this is an opinion that only makes sense if you are talking about making good games regardless of whether they sell or not and in the sort of hope that you know you make a good game and it will sell now that's not how the industry works unfortunately but that's how i would like it to work and i think i don't i think it could work like that if we thought about these games a little bit more carefully so what is this great opinion that you've just spent two three minutes up you know kind of like up, trying to make disclaimers for this opinion is, I don't care about beginners anymore, okay? When it comes to pure games design and not include, you know, I'm not including whether a game, you know, has to sell well on Steam or not, I don't care about beginners. I think beginners, if you make a good game, right, if you make a really, really, really good game and you make it so, it's so good that uh, veteran players will keep coming back and replaying it over and over and over, which is what these games are designed to do, by the way. These shmup games, right, they're designed so that they're only about half an hour, 40, an hour, 40 minutes in length. They are dense, gameplay dense. They've got complex, clever scoring systems that demand repeated play if you want to get good at them. And generally speaking, they just make the game way more... Uh, they make, make them way more replayable. Those kind of games people will come back to. And if you make them good, beginners will suffer through the difficulty because they'll want to learn how to play it because they see other players playing them on a skillful level and they want a piece of that because unlike unlike the you know the side of me that has to look at you know from a commercial perspective and has to look at every potential game player as somebody who's going to buy the game and not refund it straight away because you know it's too hard for them or because it doesn't explain things well or whatever i'm looking at the you know trying to look at them now in terms of being an intelligent person and having the you know, having the intelligence and the drive to want to learn a complex, difficult game because it's fun, yeah? Because, and that is what's going to keep them playing. That's what's going to stop them from refunding. That's what's going to keep those people playing uh, your game after 20 hours when maybe it's only got a 30 minute play time. How do you get that across into uh, the strategy genre? I don't think these two situations are quite as, uh, you know, they're, they're unrelated as people might expect. It's all well and good, you know, I, I can see some of the criticism like, oh, you know, strategy is a completely different genre to, you know, to shmups and arcade games and that. So, you know, it's completely different rules apply. I don't think the case, I don't think that's true. I think that the, the issues that, that plague bad arcade games, you know, modern action games, are very similar to the issues that plague older strategy games and 4X and that kind of stuff that did not, that weren't a problem in older games. You know, mechanical bloat is one. Every so, for example, why does every new um, fantasy forex game now have to have crafting in? Like, I don't get that at all. I don't really like crafting in games outside of Minecraft. <laughs> I don't, you know, just kind of these RPG mechanics. So, RPG mechanics have sort of crept into the platformer genre. You know, the uh, you know what people call Metroidvanias or roguelike. You know, this abomination that people call roguelikes now or roguelites, whatever like Metroidvanias, they're, they're full of RPG mechanics and I'm not always convinced that they make the games better. And it's the same with uh, modern 4X games as well. So every game seems to have to have level up systems, it seems to have some kind of crafting, these kind of, these sort of what I call meme mechanics 
that were popular in a, a you know one game or another and then you've got to kind of have it in every version of the game like that goes forward every modern you know fantasy forex now has to have crafting in it every modern crpg has to have crafting in it whether it whether the game supports it or not like i'd argue the divinity original sin games were di objectively worse games for having to for having crafting forced into them i did not like crafting in divinity original sin uh, i didn't really like it in a division of the original sin 2 either it didn't add anything to the game at all it just meant the game became became this kind of like autistic grind to pick everything up on the map <laughs> because you you know you thought oh well maybe this all this crap that i'm picking up it's going to be useful in the crafting system and it, it really just stopped me from getting to the meat of the gameplay i've now there are certain forex uh, like games where crafting is really, really good. Uh, for example, Thea is built around crafting, and I'd argue that the crafting system in Thea actually makes sense. It didn't damage that game gameplay in any way. In fact, it was part of the gameplay of Thea. So there are games where it does work, and it sits like crafting works in Minecraft, right? Because <laughs> you know it, it just works really, really well there, and that's part because it's baked into the game design. But I don't really like it when games have this sort of tra they transplant systems out of other things just because they're popular. So they can tick a box on Steam saying, "Yep, this game's got crafting." You know, one of the one well, of the bad things about crafting in many genres is it just artificially enhances. Uh, sorry, it artificially prolongs the playtime with what I call padded, you know, filling gameplay. It's just pad padding gameplay, and I don't think that's fun. By the way, this game's really cool. <laughs> This is a novice mode as well, and I've had to use, like, what? Ten, ten continues already? <laughs> yeah, I really need to be using the, uh, the, the Crimson Clover specific mechanics a little bit more. Ah! Oh no! <laughs> I like this system, right? This uh, this lock-on system is cool because you you have to lock, you can only lock on in range. I think I think there's a sort of range to it, so it sort of forces you to get close to the da the more dangerous, you know, to the things that are firing all these bullets at you. See, that's a really clever mechanic, right? Anything that that is there to kind of make you engage with the gameplay more. Um, So scoring systems that kind of force you to get closer to the dangerous stuff and it forces you to engage with the bullet hell systems of dodging these, you know, bullet patterns. Anyway, as always, um, whenever I'm playing a game like this, it's always kind of turned into a little bit of a, a channel update and me just kind of chatting about games design or just chatting about random stuff. This is really, really cool, though. I really like this game. This, this feels really different to Dodonpachi. It's def uh, because it's on the novice mode as well, it's something that I can play while I'm not really concentrating too much. Ooh. Now, I know. I, I absolutely guarantee it. That I'm going to get at least one comment from someone saying... I can't watch this game, this is giving me a headache. <laughs> I like I totally get it, right? Not everybody is into these kind of games. What else what else have I been doing recently, by the way? Because I've had a, like a two month break. Oh no, this is tough. Uh, I've had a two month break from uh, uploading. So apart from the usual stuff of working and you know, kind of uh, family stuff that you have to do. I've mo like I've mostly been playing stuff like this and fighting games. So I've really I've really gone, I went really, really hard. I actually bought Tekken 8 because I'm a lifelong Tekken player. I've been playing Tekken since, oh, that's not true, but I was playing Tekken since Tekken 1. So I played Tekken 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I think I played 5 a bit. Uh, and after that, I kind of dropped off because I stopped playing games for about six, seven years, or seven or eight years, in a period between about 2008 and about 2014. I stopped playing games for a while. And then, uh, so yeah, I missed out on Tekken 6 and maybe Tekken 5. And I got into Tekken 7, which I quite liked. But then Tekken 8 I bought and kind of, eh, I don't know, it's just stuff about it I don't like. It's got a lot of these made-for-noobs mechanics, like scrub mechanics, as I call it. Like, 
anything that kind of makes it so that new players can get into it but it it doesn't make the game better um it's actually kind of made the game objectively worse for you know like legacy players players with legacy skill and i really don't like that so i went through a big stage of okay i've hit this point of this game now where i'm having to continue every few minutes uh yeah well, so i went um and basically caught up with all the modern fighting games so you know the modern street fighter games uh, King of Fighters, Mortal Kombat, and I've been spending a month or so just playing those games and trying to figure out, again, what makes each game good? What's the... Oh, I missed my bomb, my bomb chance there. What makes this game good? Why is this more interesting or more fun than the other games than the, you know, that I'm also playing? So I bought, I bought and played a whole bunch of fighting games. And at some point, I'm going to do a video on which ones I like best, and I'll explain why. Now, uh, for those of you who are just purely strategy game focused, there is a reason for me doing this that is not just about playing new genres and being a bit bored of strategy games. It's because, like I say, I want to get, I want to get to grips. I, wa I want to be more critical about games design. I think in the past, if I go back and read some of the reviews I've done at Explorminate and stuff, I've not been critical enough of games, right? That's the whole point of being, you know, of doing games reviews. Really want to be critical because. It's all well and good, you know, being excited about a game and hyping it up and talking about what the game does well. But it's also, you know, it's important for people to sort of see what a game doesn't do well. Wow. I think this must be either the final boss or the second to final boss. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that kind of broadening my horizons when it comes to games is going to make me a better critic, really. And then ultimately, when I finally get round to uh, really getting into the games development of my own, outside of my contract work, then it will make me a better games developer as well. Uh, in terms of, I mean, you guys will remember like the last kind of channel update I did where I was talking about developing games for my uh, Commander X16. That is still going on. I'm about halfway through uh, making my first sort of strategy game design. I haven't done any coding on it yet, I've been purely just working on the games design side of it. Uh, but I got a little bit sidetracked because um, work got really, really busy. So my, the, the main contract that I'm working on at work got really busy. So, uh, but yeah, I've, I'm, I've, I've got most of the games design down, right down to sort of what the game is, what it's about. I don't really want to talk about it too much at the moment. The reason being is because one, when you talk about something too much, you kind of end up getting that dopamine hit that you do when you actually do it. So I don't want to do that too much. The other thing is, of course, is that um, there's always a chance that someone steals your idea. And it's actually quite a unique idea. So I don't really want... I don't want anyone to steal my idea, really. So, But when I've actually got something to show, then you'll be able to see it. Whoa, what the hell is going on here? I have no idea, by the way, how you're supposed to use this kind of lock-on system. I'm just kind of hoping that I'm getting it right. Oh, well, those are some kind of nasty patterns. <laughs> okay, just before it died, it just threw out like this big uh, burst of ring-shaped things. Okay. I like how you get a choice of um, a power-up at the end of the level. That's kind of cool. So this game came highly recommended to me from uh, from some of my other friends who really are into these kind of games. There must be some real um, interplay between the lock-on system and you know using your normal. Oh, this is hard, and using your normal shots um, that I'm just not really picking up on because concentrating enough. This feels really, really nice to play though. It's got a really nice feeling. Here's one aspect of uh, modern fighting games particularly, but also these kind of games that I've uh, been thinking about quite a lot, that I didn't really that doesn't translate quite so well into strategy games is kind of feel the idea of whether a game feels like nice to play and I don't uh, I'm still kind of 
a bit of a noob in the sense of being able to critique what makes a game feel good to play. I think part of it is to do with the uh, game's inputs. And it will it'll be kind of like the overall aesthetic as well. Maybe it's not completely... Oh, this is really hard. <laughs> See if I can focus on this for a bit. Oh, I don't even know what hit me then. Yeah, I probably want to be using the brake at times like that. Okay, is this the ending? Is this the end boss? One thing I noticed about this game is right, it does have little short breaks. Um, you know, these kind of shmup games, they have short little breaks, but they don't. They don't like waste your time with cutscenes or anything like that. I really like that. Like the older I'm getting, the less I like, um, the less I'm kind of tolerant of having to wait around for my gameplay. Oh. Okay, I thought I was going to get hit then, so. I unleashed the uh, the ultra mode. Ah! Oh. <laughs> I bottled out then. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, I really bottled it then. This is a great looking game though, man. Look at this. So I was reading, um, I was reading about shmups and bullet hell particularly. And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why they created these crazy patterns, right, is because it looks really attractive. So if you're making an arcade game, it really is so bright. And it just, you know, anything about these geometric patterns is uh, becomes quite attractive for people. People are sort of naturally attracted to, to geometry. The other thing, of course, is that it gives, rather than old games, uh, old shooter up games like R-Type, that kind of thing, you know, Gradius, where you had, where you had like a landscape that you had to fly through in, in addition to dispatching the enemies that, that were, you know, you had to destroy and the, the bullets that were coming at you. These games don't really have any landscape. Uh, they don't have any terrain to dodge. The terrain is the bullet patterns. So that's why they have this crazy, you know, this crazy system of these really elaborate, uh, geometric patterns for you to kind of weave your way through. Oh no! <laughs> I don't know how many continues I've used now. It's probably about 30. <laughs> now, one more thing that I wanted to say about the shmups before I finish this video, guys. Um, Games don't need to have extended playtime. This is—I was watching a video by another guy, uh, this dude called The Electric Underground. He does really good videos on these on these kind of games, and um, he was saying that he doesn't really like this whole kind of push for games to have ex like really really long playtime. To the point, there's like a website now that you can go on, like how long you know what how long to complete or whatever, and it'll tell you. Ooh, it'll tell you how long the game will be before you know that you are expected to be able to to get out of it before you complete a run of it, right? And one of the problems with this is, if games developers have kind of caught on to this, it encourages them to, to add padding, and you know, to sort of dilute the game, you know, the dense gameplay into something, you know, like, like I say, adding stuff like crafting, which is just completely unnecessary in most games, or sort of extended character creation systems like you've got in Age of Wonders, the new Age of Wonders games, where it doesn't really seem to make a whole lot of difference to the kind of the way that the game plays. It's sort of mostly cosmetic. And, uh, you know, that can, be, that can be immersive in certain ways, but it doesn't always, you know, for me, I'm just kind of bored by the time I even get into the gameplay. So, um, these sort of games, they show you that Look, I'm, I'm, this is, I think, probably going to be the final... This is the final mission now. And... Oh, no, I think it's stage five. So I, I guess with this game, you're probably looking at about 30, 40 minutes for a single playthrough. If you're the sort of player, right, that only plays a game once, like, you you know, you, you finish it once and then you're kind of done with it. There's a lot of casual players who are like that, right? Um, they, whether it's a 4X game, whether it's a... Whether it's an arcade game like this, whether... 
whether it's even like beat em up games, you know, like Street Fighter, they'll they'll play the campaign on the new Street Fighter game through, then they kind of finish, they'll do it once with one character, and then they're like, okay, check that box, completed, and they don't come back to it. Um, that is absolutely fine, but it is very indicative of a sort of atti sort of casual attitude towards game, you know, towards gaming, that is sort of throwaway, and I, I don't think that building games to please those kind of gamers is necessarily good for making games better you know like for, for the if you're if your overall goal of games design is to make games better i don't think that kind of cater like trying to cater to those sort of players is is going to make games better in a general way sure you want to get games to be accessible for new players Whoop. You want games to be accessible for new players, but you don't want to like aim your games directly at them. And these games are cool because they, they showcase that, right? Like if you're the sort of player that finishes a game once, you can just sort of blunder your way through like I've just done with Crimson Clover here and, uh, you know, win it on th using 30 or 40 credits and then go, eh, well, you know, box ticked, <laughs> game's done. But that's not what these games are about. These games are designed for replayability. And I think you'll find that most of the games that I cover on my channel are all games that are designed for replayability too. Whether it's Shadow Empire, Galsiv with its, you know, really crazy playstyle, you know, variety of playstyle that you can get. Um, whether it's something like Dominions, again, with just massive amounts of content that has also really, really dense gameplay to where the game is actually fun right from the start. Oh, that came out fast. <laughs> now, bullet hell games tend not to have very, very fast bullet pa bullet patterns until the sort of later game. Uh, it's more about slower moving formations of bullets that you kind of weave your way through, right? Uh, but And, you know, you're trying to find a space to move through. The other thing you'll note about these games is that they have a hitbox that's quite small. So you'll, you'll see that bullets seem to be flying through elements of your ship, like the wings. You've got to hit... They've got to hit you in the centre of the ship, really. You'll see there's a little hitbox. I don't know if you can see it, but it's like a little spark, you know, a little star-shaped thing in the in the centre of your ship. I believe that that will be the uh, the hitbox, basically. So it does actually give you something to kind of enable you to dodge these patterns with. Yeah, if you're looking at games design and you want to find games that, that have got high high replayability, oh bloody hell! <laughs> this is this is the kind of thing you want to be looking at. Okay, this damn thing's bouncing at me. Yikes! <laughs> no, oh, I missed time that badly. <laughs> okay. Yikes. <laughs> oh man, this is so fun. <laughs> Tricked ya. <laughs> I got it. Okay. <laughs> Only took me like, what, four credits? <laughs> there we go. Gorgonion down. Okay, I guess that's the... Uh, is that the final stage? Okay. <laughs> that was a whole lot of bonus points I got. Okay, so yeah, there we done. There's still something worth fighting for. Try beating the level 5 boss without using a continue. Okay, so here you go, look. This is the game telling you, okay... It's nudging you towards engaging with the game mechanics in a big way. Um, let's put my name in. There we go. Anyway, 
I hope you enjoyed that, folks. That is battle mode playing a game for the very first time and waffling about game mechanics. <laughs> uh, but I hope you, I hope you took something from that anyway. And uh, yeah, and I hope that this video actually came out because I feel like the audio was a little bit loud in places. So you might find that I have to re-record this. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Take care. Hey, by the way, if you're new to the channel because you were attracted to this game and it's totally different to the other stuff that I do. Uh, please like and subscribe anyway. I'd be really appreciated because uh, I'm trying to broaden you know, what I'm doing on this channel a little bit as and when I can. So I want to be talking about this kind of game a little bit more often uh, along with the strategy stuff because like I say, I feel like there is some interplay between the way that design works in slower paced strategy games, turn-based games and these really quick to play, you know, super focused arcade games too. Catch you later guys. Take care.